Good morning, Keel Street. We miss you. And we pray for the day when you will be with us. The video enjoins us to place ourselves back in the original nativity. Imagine ourselves there. It's, a, it's an important technique, particularly when reading scripture, to put yourself back there. Place yourself in the audience to hear. And like them, like the shepherds, let us be inspired to go and tell these marvels that we have seen of our God. Not just that he's born, but that he's risen, risen indeed, and able to save all who call on him. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching o'er silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy Light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth. Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born. Brought us God's salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Amen. Lord, we do come before you with joy that you were born, that you refused to stay in heaven. You refused to enjoy your privilege. You, simply, you gave it all away to come and be with us, to be a Savior who understood the human condition, to be a high priest who was just like us and yet without sin and able to save us. Lord, we thank you for the joy and the brotherhood that is set before us as those who, are, who have received your mercy. Because, Lord, it was your mercy wasn't the things we did. It wasn't our attractiveness. It wasn't our goodness. Your love reached us at the very bottom of our lives. And we thank you for that. Because our hope is built not on how good we are or how good we can behave or how good we can become, but on Jesus' blood and righteousness granted to us and we rejoice and we embrace one another from every tribe and language and people and nation in one family because of him in whose name we are praying amen so let us stay merry we have every reason for joy this is a time he has made us given us joy Okay. Got her 
Just ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. From God our Heavenly Father, a blessed angel came, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same. How that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Fear not, then said the angel, let nothing you affright. This day is born a Savior of a pure virgin bride To free all those who trust in Him from Satan's power and might Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy Oh, tidings of comfort and joy Now to the Lord sing praises, all you within this place. And with true love and brotherhood, each other now embrace. While this holy tide of Christmas, all others doth deface. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. They are tidings of comfort and joy. They are tidings of a brotherhood, but they come to us at a time when things are not well. And so we sing this Christmas hymn as, as a lament for how broken things are. They weren't less broken then. <laughs> there were the same problems in the human condition. All of us, like sheep, had gone astray. We had turned everyone to our own way. And our selfishness destroyed lives. And in the middle of that, after 400 years of silence, comes the Messiah. This is our prayer for His coming again. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Oh 
Let us remember him as a child, vulnerable. He didn't come as Superman. He came as someone who could be hurt, who could be weak, who could be at the mercy of others. But because of that, he understands all our frailties, and he will fit us for heaven so that we will fit there. Joseph sat up in his bed and leaned against the wall. The late, this late into the night, you know, the wall was cool and solid, and he pushed against it as if it were an anchor that kept him from sliding into the chaos that raged in his mind. He he had tried to get some sleep, but his thoughts refused him the courtesy of showing, slowing down enough to, to make sleep or even rest possible. Instead, his thoughts jerked him in several directions all at once, and then he landed back in the exact same place, time and time again. You know, the place he kept returning to was that afternoon. That afternoon in Mary's family home where Mary had spoken to him, uttering words he still refused to believe, and yet he had no choice but to face Mary had returned after three months of visiting her relative Elizabeth, who had just given birth to a baby boy named John. But the news was more than just about the birth of John. Mary herself was with child. A child that Mary made some startling, one might even say, desperate claims about. 
You know, if anyone else had recounted such a story, he, he would have immediately written them off. But Mary, Mary, the young woman he had fallen in love with, the, the young woman he still loved, it was hard to accept either what she claimed was true or what, quite frankly, was the more obvious alternative. There, there were so many things to love about Mary. But above all else, it was, it was her faith and her devotion to Yahweh that delighted him so. And that's why he chose her, why he approached her father, why he asked for her to, why, why he asked to be pledged to her in marriage. But there was so much more. She was a servant. She had character. She, she had never done anything that would have suggested that she could or would have slept with another man. Maybe Mary was telling the truth. How could she be telling the truth? What happened in the three months that she was away? What wasn't she saying? All he really knew was that she was pregnant and he was not the father. Those were the cold and extremely hard facts. And now he found himself in an emotional storm that washed over him in waves of disbelief and shock. It was an emotional tsunami of sadness, grief, and fear. As the debris of his life floated to the surface, he kept trying to push it down, and it kept popping up. This was not, the world was not as it was. His life was not as it was. His future was not as it was. His plans were not as they were. Can you identify? What about your world, your life, your future, your plans? Are, are they all on track? I think I can answer that question for you. And when we think about Joseph and what he went through as he faced the news of Mary's pregnancy, it doesn't take much imagination to understand that Joseph's circumstances were anything but peaceful. In fact, even after the angel appears to him in a dream and confirms the truth of Mary's claims, peace was still hard, as hard to find as, as restaurants in Toronto open for romantic dining experiences. Or, or peace was just as hard to find as gyms open for business in my neighborhood. I could keep going, but I think you get the point. Now, we, are all, we already know how this story ends. We, we already know the path that Joseph's new life would take. He had a wife he had already pledged to that had come home pregnant. He had a village that would probably think he was a gullible idiot. He, he was facing a journey to Bethlehem to register for the census. He had, a baby would be born in a stable. A midnight run to Egypt would come to escape a murderous king. These were all major zigs in a life that he had planned to be full of zags. What, what begins as a dream in this passage that we're looking at today will eventually lead him into being a refugee in Egypt, responsible for the care and safety of his young bride and his adopted son. And let's face it, Joseph's life was going to be challenging, not just for a week or a month or until the baby was born. No, what, what Joseph is facing as we meet him today is a life that will never be what he had planned it to be. His life would no longer be his life. The future he had hoped for was over. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to be looking at verses 18 to 25. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now, as we read this, I, I want you to think about everything that we've just explored about Joseph's situation. And, and then I, I want you to search for any hints of anxiety in Joseph. See if you can pick up on any stress that's seeping out in, of this whole experience. You know, I began this message with a bit of fictional speculation. 
You know, I just tried to put myself in Joseph's place and think about some of the things that I would think about. I wrote about Joseph wrestling with that night before the angel appeared to him in a dream. And certainly Joseph is human. And, and I think my speculation would have landed somewhere in the same neighborhood as Joseph. You don't have things as life-changing as, as shocking happening to you without having to process them and come to terms with them in some way. Beginning verse 18, we read, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Before we jump into this passage, I, I want us to look at the big picture for a moment. In verse 19, the phrase, he had in mind to divorce her quietly, is written in such a way as to suggest that Joseph had made up his mind. Th this wasn't something that he was considering. It was, wasn't just some possibility. The decision had been made. Joseph had wrestled with the news. He, he had weighed his options and he had come up with a plan. He would quietly divorce Mary and move on with his life. But this creates a problem. Look at verse 20 and 21 for a moment. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And there's that phrase again, that phrase that we saw last week, do not be afraid. And once again, fear's on the table. Fear is often on the table, isn't it? You know, we're told that Joseph is afraid to marry Mary, specifically. He's afraid to not take Mary home as his wife. In other words, he's afraid of his reputation. He's afraid of what others might think. He's afraid to appear sinful or gullible. He's afraid to lose his standing in the community. He's, he's afraid of what a soiled reputation would mean to his business. And there's a lot of reasons to be afraid. We can understand this. This is exactly the kind of fear that we all face. We all face fears of what others may think or what things, how things might look. Is there a fear more common to the human condition than the fear of what others may think? I, I don't think so. I don't have any hard numbers to back my thoughts up. But, but even if we think about the other common fear, which is the fear of failure, is not the fear of failure, really the fear of how we will look to others when we fail. Isn't the fear of failure really the fear of what others think about us? Notice what the angel says to Joseph. He, sa he says two things. Mary, the girl, Mary, Mary, and name the boy Jesus. The angel is quite specific. He isn't going to leave anything to chance. You know, why is that? It's because in that culture, Joseph naming the baby is the act of Joseph claiming the child as his own. This had to happen for Jesus to be legally considered of the line of David. 
And the specifics of the name are the specifics of why Jesus entered into our experience. Jesus means that Yahweh saves. He came to save his people. So the variables we're dealing with in this moment in salvation history are particularly important. Joseph needs to change his mind. The decision he made, partially informed by his fear of what others might think, had to be reversed. Here was another zig where Joseph had planned a definite zag. So here we find Joseph with his life upside down and his heart broken, he had made up his mind. He was moving on with his life. But but here's the thing. Joseph needed to change his mind. God had to intervene and change Joseph's plans in order for his promises to be fulfilled. But here's the point I want you to consider. Do you think that Joseph was at peace with his decision? Well, the text seems to indicate that he wrestled with it enough to realize that he he didn't want to be harsh in his approach to Mary. In other words, he had let his anger and his betrayal bubble enough that it dissipated and he could think about Mary and that he still cared for her. I think he was a genuinely righteous man. He, He was concerned about keeping the law. And based on the information he had, his decision was a solid one. But that still doesn't mean that Joseph was at peace, does it? Why do I say that? It's because no matter how much Joseph rationalized his decision, it was still a decision decided in fear. And a decision decided in fear does not bring peace. It it can't bring peace. But at the same time, as you look at Joseph and how he reacts to the dream and how he reverses his decision, you're going to see that Joseph truly does have peace. He he truly seems to possess the peace that transcends understanding that Paul talks about in Philippians 4.7. So Joseph's peace is not found in peaceful circumstances, obviously. And his peace isn't found in his decision made in fear either. His peace has another source. His peace comes from God. Now, now maybe some of you are thinking, and, and rightly so, wait a minute, Grant, how can Joseph have peace that comes from God when in fact all the lack of peace in his life is caused by God? In fact, being part of God's plan seems to be the source of all Joseph's future stress. Well, yeah, there's that. But, but here's the thing. The stress that comes from being part of God's plan and facing our fears is replaced by a peace and satisfaction that comes from being obedient to and being used by God. So how is it that Joseph can navigate such stormy circumstances in his life and, and still find peace? What exactly can we learn from Joseph? Joseph. Well, first of all, we can learn from Joseph about his compassion. We need compassion if we're going to have peace. Let's look at verses 18 to 19 for a moment. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together... She was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. And this means they were legally married, but they hadn't yet started their lives together yet. As I mentioned last week, for a year after the pledge of marriage, the couple were considered married, but the woman would continue to live in the house with her family and then would, but at the same time, was considered married. One day, the wedding procession would come and would go from her house, the family house, to the groom's house, and they would have this grand celebration, and then the marriage would be consummated. 
But, but during this time of pledge, they were still legally married. They just weren't engaged. It was much more than that. In fact, they couldn't call off the marriage without divorce. And, and those who were unfortunate enough to lose their husband or wife to death during this period were considered widowed. So, so Joseph and Mary were married, but they had yet to have their marriage finalized. Mary was still living with her parents, and just in case we miss the point, Matthew states, this happened before they came together. Before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. You know, through the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is something that the readers of Matthew's gospel are to already understand and know, but at this point, Joseph hasn't found out. He, he hasn't found out about the Holy Spirit, and he hasn't found out what's all happening with her having or being with child. You get the impression that, that he wasn't told that Mary was pregnant so much as he, as he figured it out, and then he confronted her, probably after asking questions came the confession. Regardless, the entire situation creates a huge problem for Joseph. You see, Joseph is described as, as a righteous man, meaning that he took being obedient to the law seriously, and a willful disregard of the law was out of the question for him. And in this situation, the law demanded a particular kind of response from him. So Joseph could not in good conscience fulfill his marital obligations with Mary. His desire to live for God kept him from that from being a possibility. The only option apparent to Joseph was either to expose Mary to public shame by initiating a legal proceeding as outlined in Deuteronomy 22, verses 30, 20, uh, 23 through 27, or to pursue a private settlement by simply handing her a bill of divorce in the presence of two witnesses as described in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. Put yourself in Joseph's sandals for a moment. Your wife comes back pregnant after being away for three months. You weren't there with her. You had no idea what really went on. All that you know is she was pregnant. Many men would have publicly divorced their wives out of anger. Others would have wanted to make it public to distance themselves from the situation and make sure that their reputations remained unblemished. But that's not Joseph's style. That, that's not Joseph's heart. Joseph wanted to obey the law, but Joseph's obedience was not legalistic. You can obey the law without being legalistic. Joseph loved Mary. He cared about her. And so Joseph was as concerned about showing compassion to Mary as he was about being obedient to the law. So he doesn't abandon his faithfulness to the law to care for Mary, but neither does he abandon Mary when her condition presented him with a dilemma about his own righteousness. His approach is one that tried to, to balance his obedience with his compassion. Joseph was faced with the difficult decision of, of what to do with Mary. His desire to honor God meant that he couldn't overlook her sin, but rather than using the law as a hammer and responding in anger, Joseph's initial response is to, is to be compassionate. Probably not his initial response, but his, his thought-through response was to be compassionate. You know how different he was than the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They used the law as a weapon, but, but Joseph understood that part of being righteous is being compassionate and caring. So what's the general principle that we're to take from Joseph's example that will help us to find God's peace? Joseph didn't enter a chaotic situation and try to find peace by seeking what he wanted. Instead, he thought about Mary. And even if his approach would cause him some damage by not going public, he was willing to take the chance out of love for Mary. So... Joseph thought about others. 
And because Joseph thought about others, it was easy for him to change his plans and to come in line with God's plans. And that's how we find peace, seeking the good of others, even when it costs us. And what I find so compelling about Joseph is, is that he had the perfect opportunity to seek what was right for himself. You know, at least at this point, when he doubts Mary's story. The only reasonable conclusion he could have come up with was that he was betrayed. He was dishonored. He knew that Mary had been unfaithful. He didn't know it. That wasn't her claim, but the evidence strongly suggested that. But more than that, the law demanded that he do something about it. He could, in good conscience, use the law as a hammer. He, he could have been like the Pharisees in John chapter 8 who paraded a woman caught in adultery publicly through the streets. He could have done that. Joseph would have been justified in making that decision. But that's not the decision that he makes. You know, it's interesting that we're told that Joseph came to the decision to be compassionate to Mary and to think of her needs more than his own right before the angel appears to him in a dream. Is it merely that Joseph had to come to terms with what he was going to do before he was able to fall asleep? Or was there something more? Does God wait for Joseph to act with compassion before he reveals his plan? Maybe God is only willing to reveal his plans to compassionate hearts. What do you think? We sometimes think the best way for our own peace is by demanding what we deserve. And we think being vindicated and finding justice is our way to peace. In reality, that kind of attitude only leads to more chaos. The way to peace is to seek the good of others. It's to act with compassion. Acting with compassion may not change the circumstances of our chaos, but it will help us to find peace during them. Let's move on. The next principle that we can learn from Joseph that will allow us to experience God's peace is to pray. Now you might be thinking, where in this passage do we see Joseph praying? We don't exactly. But we do have Joseph communicating with God, or more correctly, God communicating with Joseph. And prayer is not only us communicating our wish lists to God in prayer. In prayer, we are also to listen to God and allow him to speak into our lives, right? Well, Joseph had a dream in which God tells him what to do. And, and what's interesting about this whole situation is that what God tells Joseph to do is completely different than what Joseph thought he should do to honor God. Now, the reason for this was simple. Joseph didn't have enough information. He didn't see the part he was about to play in God's plan. And he didn't understand the part that Mary was already playing in God's plan. He didn't see or recognize God's hand at work. All he saw was his painful circumstances. All he saw was confusion. So more than anything else, Joseph needed perspective. He needed God's perspective. And the only way he could get God's perspective was through listening to God. By reading his word, by listening to what God would say to his heart. Now, it, it would be great if every time we went to bed at night that we would know that we'd have a dream in which God would communicate his will to us for the next day. <laughs> at least I think it would be great. You know, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's never happened to me. It, it doesn't, God doesn't work that way. God doesn't often speak to us that way. You know, in fact, Scripture tells us that such happenings are few and far between. Of course, this opens a whole other question. How do we know when a dream is from God or from a slice of pizza we had just before we went to bed or what other COVID comfort food we just ingested? It's a good question to ask for another sermon sometime. All that aside, the principle here is that through prayer, we need to allow God to speak into our lives. 
We need to do that all the time, but particularly when we're facing difficult decisions. Particularly when everything within us wants us to respond immediately and with force because we're hurt. You know, let's face it, the worst thing we can do is to react immediately to the chaos that comes into our lives. Chaos is kind of like water. I remember a Mythbusters episode way back when. It might be my favorite one. And it had to do with ninja myths. That's why I remember it. You know, if you put the Mythbusters together with ninjas, that's my happy place. I miss that show. Well, one of the myths had to do with ninjas hiding underwater and being able to shoot an arrow that hit its target. You see, the problem with trying to shoot someone when you're underwater and and looking up through the water's surface is that the surface acts as a lens and it refracts and distorts the angle of our vision. So you must be able to aim taking into account that distortion that's taking place or you're going to miss your target. Keep that in uh, in mind next time you're at the bottom of a pool with bow and arrow. (laughs) Chaos. Anxiety, worry, and fear are like the surface of the water. They distort our vision, and we can't see things as they really are. But if we wait before we shoot and and talk to God before we shoot, we'll have a much better chance of hitting our target of peace. The bottom line is that when we turn our decisions over to God and let him have his say about what we should do, his peace overtakes even the most chaotic, fearful circumstances. You know, look at what happens with Joseph after God communicates with him through the dream. God shows him another option. And that's the way it is with God. He often gives us more options than we think we have or that we want to take. Moses and the Israelites were stuck between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. They thought they were out of options, and then God suggests another option, an option of faith that they would have never thought of. Abraham looked down at his son and up at his knife, and he thought he was out of options until God spoke and offered him a completely different option, one that was provided by him. In the case of Joseph, he seems to be doing the right thing by breaking the engagement, but then God gives him another option, a completely different option. In the case of Joseph, he seems to be doing the right thing by breaking the engagement, but God gives him another option. God helps him to make the best decision. Let's look at the last principle. We can learn from Joseph's example of how to find God's peace. It's simply this, Joseph obeyed. Look at verse 24 for a moment. It is the most important verse in the whole passage. Joseph had godly motives. He, he, he was motivated by compassion and he led God speak into the decision But none of that would have mattered if Joseph didn't listen to what God wanted and then went ahead and did something different than what he wanted. It's so hard for us to do what God wants instead of what we want. That's really the wrestling that we have as we walk between the cross and his return wrestling with what we want and what he wants and what path we take. Verse 24 tells us that when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Joseph did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. Joseph was on board with God's plan. So the only way to experience the peace of God, even at Christmas, is to do things his way. Now, what did that mean for Joseph? Well, it meant that he had to forget about the, his fear of taking Mary home to be his wife. In other words, Joseph had to care more about what God wanted than what people thought. It's kind of a painful thing to say, isn't it? Or to think. Joseph cared more about what God wanted than what people thought. That's exactly what we have to do as well. You know, with, with Joseph's decision to, marry, to take Mary home, 
came this huge blow to Joseph's reputation. People would assume either that he was the father or that he was a fool. But of course, it would mean so much more than that. It would also mean abstaining from consummating the marriage until after Jesus was born. That's told to us in verse 25. You know, think about it. For many today, allowing God to rule your sexual purity is unthinkable. It's off the table completely. But that's just part of what Joseph surrenders to God's will. There's also a trip to Bethlehem and fleeing to Egypt in a life that would never be what it, he had planned it to be because his life was now God's life. But I don't want you to think that Joseph was settling. No, no doing things God's way creates stress and sacrifice and difficulty in Joseph's life, un, unquestionably. But it also gave him the peace of being used by God. And there's no greater peace. There's no greater satisfaction. You see, that's what it's all about. There's no greater satisfaction in life, no greater peace than knowing that you are serving and pleasing God. That's why we were created. That's, that's our purpose for being. Obedience, surrender, sacrifice always brings peace from God. It, it's counterintuitive, I realize, but it's true. Doing our will often seems like the easiest, most peaceful way. Many would even say that if we don't satisfy our own will and our own desires in life, we'll never find peace. But the only way to truly experience peace amid the chaotic world that we live in is to do things God's way. Ignoring God's way only creates more chaos. It only creates more stress. I remember when Sheila and I got the call to move to Latit, New Brunswick. We were coming back from a visit uh, from Toronto. So we dropped in to visit the people there and, and to meet with the leadership on our way back uh, to PEI, where we were living at the time. I'll never forget the feeling I had when I drove to the church. I'd gotten used to living in rural PEI. That, that was enough of a, of a change from living in Toronto. It, it took a, a long time to do that, but rural New Brunswick is far more rural than rural <laughs> PEI. And, and all I saw on the drive down to Latite from the St. George were rocks and trees and trees and rocks with the occasional house that needed some paint. When we got into Back Bay, I thought we'd reached the end of the world. And I quite honestly said, Lord, this really is the middle of nowhere. I don't want to be here. Now, you might think that as soon as we met the people, everything changed. True, there were some amazing people, like the family we stayed with that weekend. But, but I also met one of the elders, and, and he was quite frankly unfriendly and argumentative that weekend. So I walked away thinking, you know, I don't know, Lord. What are you doing to me? Well, well, to make a long story short, over the next few months, we went back a few more times, and we received the call to go there. And we ended up spending six years in Latit. And those six years were wonderful. They were healing and full of amazing friendships and, and changed lives. You know, it's funny how that drive that I hated so much the first time I went there became a beautiful drive after I moved there. Looking back on it, I can only say that I needed Latit probably more than they needed me. I, I found a peace there that I would never have expected. Being obedient to God goes that way. It begins with feelings like we're in way over our heads and we're giving up too much, but it always ends up with us being blessed by the peace that comes from knowing that we've listened to and obeyed God's will. Do you want to know the way to God's peace? Be compassionate. Think of the interests of others. Pray, ask God to communicate his best option to you before you settle for the option that you want to do. Don't be too quick to react to the chaos. Don't have a knee-jerk reaction. And certainly don't e email anybody when you're thinking that way. That's, that's the end of everything when you do that. Instead, react to the chaos with prayer. 
before you send that text, before you make that comment on Facebook, before you do anything, react to the chaos with prayer. Finally, be obedient to God's word and his will. You see, God has a plan for each of us, and and God has a way in which he wants us to live, and the way isn't about ruining our fun or restricting our freedom. It's about us finding peace that only comes from knowing and serving and following God. It's about each of us finding our place in God's plan. And when we find our place in God's plan, even if it's not what we thought it was or where it was, we will have peace. We may not have peaceful circumstances. Our our circumstances may look even more chaotic, in fact. But we will have the peace that only Christ provides. The peace that passes all understanding. I want you to think about that peace as we come to the Lord's table. A peace purchased with the blood of Christ. A peace founded on his promise to be with us until the end of the age. A peace made possible only through the sacrifice and the lordship of Christ. Only made possible as we submit to that sacrifice, as we claim it for our sins, and as we place ourselves under his lordship, knowing that the life we live for ourselves always creates more chaos. But under his lordship comes peace, for he is the prince of peace. Thanks, Grant. The central theme of this song is that we need to make room for him. Need to make room in our hearts to hear from him and to obey him because of what he left behind for us. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy nativity. Heaven's arches rang when the angels sang, proclaiming thy royal degree. But of lowly birth didst thou come to earth, and in greatest humility. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. The foxes found rest and the birds their nest in the shade of the forest tree. But thy couch was the sod, O thou Son of God, in the desert of Galilee. Thou should set thy people free. But with mocking scorn and with crown of thorn, they bore thee to Calvary. Yet there is room, there is room at my 
sigh for thee, and my heart shall rejoice, Lord Jesus, when thou comest and callest for me. This week, I pray that you go in peace by being compassionate, by meeting with God in prayer, and by doing his will rather than your own. May you be a light. May you be a sense of joy to those around you. May in the chaos that comes this week, may you be the compassion that brings peace to others. God bless.